is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 361. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, where hopefully it's not as stormy as it is here, it's Luis Scott Vargas. LSV, how are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing well. It is sunny. And uh, I guess Must be that, nice. that beats Seattle for once. Though Actually, it's way sunnier here than in Seattle in general. I've heard that there's a lot more clear days or whatever on on average. Yeah, a lot more snow too, but you know. Yeah, I was going to say cuz you know when when you're talking about Seattle, you're talking about overcast a lot, but not snow. Like we don't really do snow. We get it once every couple of years. Um yeah. so on this episode of the show Luis, we are going to go over we're going to go really in depth here. This is the the show where you and I have got plenty of Kaladesh drafts under our belts. Now I've been drafting it like a madman. I know you have two on your stream. And uh, that means that we've really got to know some of the uh, archetypes. We've really well, got to know Before we get that... too deep, uh, I, I want to uh-huh. note that most most of my drafts, uh, when I'm at home, I don't wear a belt because I wear like basketball shorts. So I, I don't <laughs> Why think is that, that relevant holds here? up. You said we had a lot of drafts under our belt, but like I... <laughs> I'm just saying that that's not technical. It wasn't an an analogy. (laughs) What are you talking about? All right. Do you you feel like you've corrected me (laughs) properly now that we can move on? (laughs) So we're we're going to – Where are you going with this? Yeah. Now I'm trying to figure that out myself. Uh, But but we've been able to to figure out these archetypes enough to really speak in depth about them and go into a few of the ones that you and I have uh, really sort of picked out as the ones that we – like to draft a lot. So we're going to be doing that on the show this week. Before we get into all that, a little business to take care of here. First things first, our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. We do urge you to check them out. If you need magic cards, Channel Fireball is the place to go. They have a full selection of singles. They've also got sealed product and even stuff like supplies, t-shirts, play mats, all that kind of stuff at Channel Fireball. And while you're there, you can check out awesome free content. And I say that every week on the show because really it is to me one of the the best polls. It's free. You show up and you can just read articles from Owen Turtenwald, you know, from Reed Duke, from some of the best players in the world. We're talking about highly, highly ranked top five players in the world telling you their secrets, showing you how to sideboard, how to play a deck, how to draft on a video. And you can find all this stuff at Channel Fireball all the time. It's really awesome to be able to to go there and feel like not only can you pick up all the stuff you need to play our game, but you can also improve at it while you're there with some great personalities from the Magic community. So please do check them out, channelfireball.com. Also, the show is brought to you by you via the Patreon. That's right. You can subscribe via the Patreon. You get some extra bonuses. Sure, the show's free. You don't have to. But if you found that it's enriched your life in some way or that it makes you happy or that maybe you've earned some extra booster packs that you wouldn't have earned otherwise and you want to give back a little this is the way to do it you can go to patreon.com slash limited resources and you can sign up you can set monthly limits so that you always stay within your budget and you can pay whatever you want per episode you can pay a buck anything doesn't matter you'll get a free uh well you'll get a card in the mail a thank you card in the mail for that. And uh, depending on what you do end up giving, you can get a bunch of extra perks, including no matter what level you're at, you're eligible for our giveaways. And I've been going ham on these. I, I am all about the giveaways now. I've got a bunch of stuff here to give away going forward. I'm just going to keep it rolling here. And uh, we do have a winner for this week. This is for a, uh, a LR gift pack, which is an LR deck box, two packages of LR sleeves, and a sticker as well. This one is going to go to... Sean Murray from Nashville. Thank you so much, Sean, for your continued support of the podcast. We really do appreciate it. And uh, if you want to be eligible for next week's prize, there's more coming. Uh, All you have to do is sign up on the Patreon, any level, and you are in the hat. And I'll pull a name every week. So thank you very much, Sean, uh, for your support and for everybody else who does that. Now, we've got a question of the week. The question of the week is also one of the perks that you get for being a patron. All of our patrons get access to the patron Patreon feed. And part of that is I'll put up a thread with our question of the week and you could submit one and see if we, uh, if we end up asking it on the show, this one comes from Finn Ellis who says, Hey guys, how do you plan for your plan? Not working. Interesting lead in there from Finn. I sometimes find myself building around a specific idea of how I want my deck to work, like a a particular synergy or some nice blockers plus these control cards, that kind of thing, only to find out that after a stumble or an unexpected choice from an opponent, my deck just feels dead. 
Is that just variance? A sign my plan wasn't good enough? Or should I be thinking more about contingencies? Thank you, Finn, for the question. Uh, I think this is a really, really good question. I'm going to lead off with this one, Luis, because this is one that uh, I I like to bring up to people uh, who are kind of at the intermediate stage for limited. Uh, They tend to get very optimistic. (laughs) What happens is, uh, you know, sometimes the plan can be a big picture plan like Finn uh, references here. And it can be something like, I'm going to block on the ground and attack in the air. Or I'm going to play a bunch of defensive creatures and kill you with my uh, late game spell or something like that. And and that's, I think, a more respectable overall game plan that's more implementable from game to game. But you also see people say, you know, first pick a card of some sort and say, all right, this is my plan. I've got a blank, some big build around card or some build big payoff card or something like that. And then, especially if it happens to be pack one, pick one, they will then kind of craft every single pick for the rest of the draft around this card. And sometimes that leads to a pretty sweet game plan that's a little more coherent. And sometimes it's a little too focused on that one card. And the the thing that I like to do is I like to ask the players that, you know, to kind of figure out where you're at on this scale is if I took your deck and I took that one card out and replaced it with something, say, replacement level, like a solid common in your colors, you know, something decent, but nothing great. Um, How'd your deck look? What's, What's your plan? How does that work? Is is your deck still a thing or does it just fall apart? Is it like, oh, no, if I don't have that card in my deck, then my, my whole plan doesn't doesn't work. Because I got bad news for you. <laughs> Sometimes you're not going to draw that card. Sometimes uh, people will counter it or have an answer to it that you didn't expect. Like Finn references here, you know, some type of card that you're like, oh, wow, they actually played this. Oh, my God. And they they destroy or counter your your big finish or or your key synergy card or whatever. And I think that that's something that you should keep in mind because most good control decks, you can take away their biggest best finisher and they can still win. Yes, their deck got weaker. That's not the point. The point isn't that can you know is my deck worse? Of course it's worse. We just took your best card away. But can it still win? Does it have a viable backup plan? And these are a lot of the questions that I like to ask myself. And also, it's a it's a thing that I like to put different strategies against. If one is too all in on one card, then you're taking a lot of risk of either having that card not drawn, counter destroyed, whatever. And uh, I think it's something that you should consider. What, what are your thoughts on this, Louise? You did a pretty good job covering uh, the main risk of going too deep on a single card. The, the best build around strategies are ones that you have a bunch of different cards working towards the same goal. Uh, An example from this format is energy. Is Sure, Whirler Virtuoso or Dynavolt Tower might be your best energy card in your deck, but a good energy deck's gonna have like, you know, six or seven or eight cards that make energy and like three or four cards that use them so that you're not dependent so much. Like you don't just lose if Whirler Virtuoso is the last card in your deck. And because you, you do need to, you do need to bear in mind that some games will come down to that. Or you, you know, you make a, a metallurgic summons deck, which I actually think can be viable, but then your opponent just sides in like two disappearing acts, and all of a sudden they can just counter metallurg- metallurgic summons, and your oh, yeah. deck doesn't do that. That's much. a great example, by the way. The summonings. That's that's one that you see people be like, "All right, we're doing it." And heck, the next time I open it, I'm doing it too. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is interesting is to note that if that card goes away, you know, your deck probably looks a lot worse. So, so redundancy is is part of it. Uh, another part of it is you want like besides just having backups of your build around, you ideally have cards that kind of play multiple roles, like. A card like a Thriving Rhino makes energy, but is still like a decent way to either kill your opponent or block their creatures. So you're 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 not looking for cards that have just no game effect and make four energy. Like Consulate Surveillance is the kind of card which I don't, mm. I don't particularly like, even though it generates a bunch of energy. Mm-hmm. So I think having having a good backup plan or cards that do a good job defending you when your plan isn't working are, are important. And yeah, sometimes your plan just doesn't work and you do die. That's also just something that's on the table. Yeah. And, and I don't, I think the key here, right, is, I, and, and the reason why I brought up the whole, if I take this card away, what does your deck look like scenario? And another one, by the way, that came to mind for that is Metalwork Colossus, the card that you first picked on your stream the other day. And I, I didn't defend it as correct, by the way. No, I know that. I, I, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant it's a good example, right? Because again, l- let's say I take the Metalwork Colossus out of your deck. 
Are you running a bunch of non-creature artifacts just basically for, you know, are you running off-color puzzle knots and stuff just like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get this thing down on turn 5. <laughs> right. And and you know, that is the dividing line for me because you can run let's say on-color puzzle knots in those decks where you're still generating value and if you never see your thing, at least you're doing something with your mana and getting something even if it's a little less than you would hope for, but the times when you do draw the colossus and play it on turn 5, it's this huge problem for your opponent. You know, that that's the thing. And and what I was going for earlier, of course, is where, where on the scale are you? And, and, and I think that that, that quick litmus test of if I take the metallurgic summonings or the metalwork colossus out of my deck, have I gone completely overboard and I'm playing these horrible instants that don't do anything, but I was thinking, well, it's an instant and I need those for my, my metallurgic summonings. You know, that's probably a good sign that maybe you've gone a bit too deep. Well, I do want to say like using that colossus example, I had mm-hmm. three gear seeker serpents. So mm-hmm. Those are my mini Colossus, you know. Those, there you those, go. And those are exactly what I'm talking about, where I could not draw Colossus and I could draw Gear Seeker and Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot and still feel pretty good about this combination. Yeah, but, and, and like if I would have walked up and taken out Metalwork Colossus and put like an Iron League Steed in there or something. My deck would have gotten better probably. It might have, <laughs> but that wasn't going to go there because I know that, yeah. you know, I knew what you were doing. You were having fun and, and pushing the boundaries a little bit, right? It wasn't, you, you weren't you know, day two at approach her or something. Right? I mean, I also was legit curious. Uh, we're getting yeah. a astray here. How good Metal Colossus is? Like how often do you have a chance to draft that card? Yeah. And, and so, so that's a thing, but here's the thing. If I would have come up and taken that card out and replaced it with something, you know, good, good to medium, your deck would have been fine, you know, because of those gear seeker serpents, right? So yeah. you would have passed that test and said, no, no, it's still okay. Like I've clearly pushed in a direction here, but I haven't gone so overboard you know, that it, it would have fundamentally changed everything about my deck not to have this. Okay, right. so thank you, Finn, for the question. Um, and before we go to crack a pack, I have to ask Luis, well, what was the what was the uh, result? Uh, the deck played out pretty well. I, I still am not sold on Metal Rock Colossus. My deck was actually a little short on artifacts. I, I would have taken artifacts or basically anything at the end of pack three, and I just couldn't find enough. Uh-huh. I think I ended up going like 2-1 or something. But Okay. The, the deck was good. I think the the main takeaway for me is that Gear Seeker Serpent's probably just better than Metal Work Colossus. But. I see. Yeah, <laughs> which I think you knew that, but yeah, I kind of. All right, let's uh, let's do a cracker pack here for Kaladesh. Uh, this one comes from Michael from GP Providence. Thank you very much, Michael, for the pack. It's very kind of you to give me this booster pack, which I am now tearing open. God, I'm still recovering from yesterday, by the way. What happened yesterday? You know what happened yesterday. I was assaulted on Twitter. Relentlessly. Uh, Terror of the Fairgrounds. <laughs> this nope. card is not not uh, one I've had the misfortune to have to play. I haven't played it yet either. Uh, just four mana, five, two. Just can crew some bad vehicles, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is not the way to do that. <laughs> Um, thriving Ibex. Yeah, the the, the Thrivex. It, it's yeah. a, a fine playable, but nothing more than that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Pima Outrider. I, I still like this card a lot. Yeah, Pima Outrider is quite good. Yep. Um, it is interesting, by the way. I do want to note something here as we talk as we work our way through the pack that uh, at this point in the format, since we're going to be going deep on the um, on the archetypes and such, I do find it really interesting to note something psychologically that happens to us, to me, to everybody, I think, um, which is that the boring but powerful cards start to fade. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we start to, I think we value them less as the format goes sweet. on. Yeah, because they're just not flashy or like I don't feel clever for playing like a Renegade Freighter or whatever. Like week one, it was like, oh yeah, check this out. I know Renegade Freighter is good and you don't. Bang, right? Now it's like everybody knows that card's good or cards like this one, Pima Outrider, not flashy. Right. It's a kind of a boring. It's like, okay, well, sometimes it's big trampler, sometimes it's a medium trampler with a little friend. But what what I found is that, you know, you, you really do have to remember that like cards like P Mount Rider still very much hold their own. And I see people in draft videos and stuff just like overlook these type of cards, like, eh, I've kind of done that. You know, it's like, eh, this card's still good. Workshop assistant hasn't really, I've never really gotten ha- hasn't card. really lived up. No. Yeah, to do anything. Uh consulate skygate. Not a big fan of that one. I either. do actually like Concept Skygate in like the right deck, but it's, that's definitely not a deck I'm starting in pick one. Like Concept right. Skygate's the kind of card I pick up pack two or three when I already know my deck is just complete nonsense. Right. Uh, what about impeccable timing? I've heard mixed reviews on impeccable timing, but I've always found it to be uh, fine. 
Yeah, the card is clearly playable. It's just not premium. It looked like yeah. it might be premium coming in, but I, I do not believe it is. I think that the white decks want to remove blockers instead of kill blockers. Uh, so, so, you know, you, you want to kill a potential blocker to attack your opponent, not have them block and then use impeccable timing. And then there's a lot of, like, reasonably sized creatures in the format. So I'm not I'm not big on impeccable timing, though. Uh, I think it's, what, the second best card right now after Pima Outrider. Yeah, I do too. Uh, this one I will not usurp it. It is Curio Vendor. I have uh, also never played this, though I have cited it. Uh, Riparian Tiger. Hey, Pima Outrider's slightly bigger brother. Yeah, I like Pima Outrider more, even though I do the, too. Tiger, the Tiger's fine. Yeah, I agree. Uh, speaking of bad equipment, you, or excuse me, uh, vehicles, Ardara Express. Yeah, our, our, our friend, the uh, sideboard Ardara Express. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> not taking this one here. Nope. Um, Eager Construct. Card I've played actually quite a bit. I think the card is fine. Yeah. I was not impressed initially, but the fact that it's a two-drop artifact actually makes it a lot more playable than I think uh, I would have initially guessed. Yeah. I, I, I still like it uh, yeah. worse than Pima Outrider. Sure. I do too, yeah, by a significant margin. But it is interesting. Um, you know, the thing that I've realized that I really do like, um, you know, are artifact creatures. Because there are so many cards that care about artifacts entering the battlefield. Are you controlling an artifact? And... It is tough when you have to play like a puzzle knot, which is generally a low impact play. Um, you know, an eager construct is a type of card that you can follow up, you know, an embral bruiser or, you know, a doomed operative or something like that. And you're still developing your board. You're not just playing an artifact just to make your other cards good, which can get kind of precarious. This is actually just a card that's fine, right? It's a two, two for two. It's okay. Like you're, you're attacking, you're blocking, you're doing stuff, but you also get that key artifact synergy and, I, I found that, you know, you can play the off-color uh, ones if you need to, but it's really not desirable. And the Eager Construct is just better enough that I'm like, yeah, okay, you, good dog. You make the cut. Ooh. Well, we've got a competitor here and as our first uncommon. Skywhaler shot. Oh, well, this is clearly the best card right now. Ooh. Uh, just killing a creature with a three or more power is great, and you can scry one for three mana, so... It's just a removal spell with upside that's cheap and instant speed. So, yeah, I'm in. Here's a card that I think I'm not as high on as I've heard some people be like, yeah, I really like this card. It's it's Bowmap Bizarre Barge. The 5-5-4 uh, draws yeah. a card. I, I, it's weird. This is classically one of those cards that I, uh, I, I can't really find anything too bad to say about it. But um, I almost never get them because people take them way, way higher than I do. I do not think this card is a first pick, and people tend to take it in their first or second picks. It seems like yeah. so. Yes, I do. Not, I also do not get too many of them. Yeah, I'm, I would uh, it's it's a fine card. It just a lot of times you spend four mana and you do not advance the board because it has a relatively high crew cost, even if you're drawing a card for it. Right. Yeah, it's not a bad card though. I do like yeah. it. I just would love to pick it up like fifth or sixth or fourth. Yeah, and, or, you never know, and it just doesn't happen. Um, Spark of Creativity, that's the red sorcery. Choose target creature, exile a top card of your library. You may have Spark of Creati Creativity deal damage to that creature equal to the exiled card's converted mana cost. If you don't, you can play it. Uh, turn. A card I tend to play because it, it, it you know, mostly at worst cycles if you don't have a lot of situational cards because you target a creature and if it dies, then you actually got a good deal. And if it doesn't, you get to play the land or the spell you revealed. It's just it just kind of falls apart when you reveal like a combat trick. Right. So I think the card is fine. It's just it's not great though. It's not a card I put up you know any sort of premium on. No, I'm the same. All right, we've got a rare here. It is Etherflux Reservoir, which has <laughs> the word the number fifty on it two different times. Yeah, whenever you play a spell, gain one life for each spell you've played this turn, and then you can pay fifty life to deal fifty damage to a creature or player. An yeah. ability I have used, by the way. You what? I have used this card in limited. I have paid 50 life to kill my opponent. When did you do that? Uh, I did it on stream, like, before the Pro Tour. Uh, you, you were already at Grand Prix Atlanta. I think God, I point. missed that. That's insane. Yeah. yeah, I actually went off with uh, Either Squall Ancient and Thriving Turtle and I, oh. I want to say Decoction Module. It's got to be and, Decoction Module, yeah. Yeah, and I just, like, played, like, four spells a turn and then just, yeah. Oh, I'm so mad I missed that. I, I was always wondering, every time I see it, I thought, uh, I'm not quite to that point in the format yet, <laughs> right, where I'm going to go for that. But you did it? Oh, I'm so jealous right now. Yeah, By the way, we're both slamming Skywhaler shot here. Oh, right? yeah, that's not, not close. Yeah, all right. So we got a Skywhaler shot, and I will put this uh, Aether Flux Reservoir into 
my little package of cards to send out to a lucky patron at some point here. Of course, we do send all our rares out to the patrons, in case you didn't know. Even the ones that Luis opens at home on his own and brings to GP Dallas. Yeah, GP Dallas. That's where I'm going to bring the, the, these Innistrad rares that I opened. We're going to be there, by the way. We are. We should mention that real quick. Yeah, GP Dallas uh, coming up in this weekend, uh, if you listen to the show on time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Modern Grand Prix hosted, uh, or rather covered by ChannelFireball.com and uh, hosted by uh, Professional Event Services. Yeah. And we will be, uh, myself, you, Huey, and Gabby will be bringing you coverage of every round plus the top eight. So it should be fun. It's going to be pretty sweet. Yeah. Twitch.tv slash magic twitch.tv slash channel fireball channel fireball okay um okay so let's get into these archetypes we've hand selected a few of our favorites here we've got what five five of them i think that we picked we, we're starting with five and then uh the tentative plan is to do more next week but we'll see how these go yeah we'll see how these ones go and how useful they are for you of course you know you guys know we're always open to feedback about any of the topics ideas shows that we have uh, our whole goal for this show is to help you improve at magic and have a good time doing it and uh, that means we need to know you know hence the the survey we talked about the last few weeks and that kind of stuff you can um, let us know anytime if you have any feedback uh, twitter's yeah. the best place for it um just because it's, it's quick but you know the subreddit's a good place to do it too yeah, Twitch or so Twitch, Reddit.com slash r slash lr cast, and then there's a sticky every week for the episode. So yeah, posting in that thread, uh, I well, I always read that thread. So it's, it is it is a good place to to put any sort of feedback you have regarding our shows. Because if no one says anything, then we just assume the show was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Luis lives his life, and I'm just like, hey, it works for me. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into these. The first one that we're going to talk about is one that I've been drafting actually quite a bit and didn't draft as much early in the format as I thought I would. It's Blue White Blink. Um, <clears throat> this is a deck, uh, you know, it's kind of a value deck, right? It's a deck that can, can generate value on board. Uh, with flyers, it tries to dominate the mid to late game with reoccurring in a, <clears throat> enters a battlefield effects from creatures. Some of the uncommons that you're going to want to look at, and this is kind of how we're going to break down each archetype are by notable uncommons, key commons, and then how do you get into this deck? And of course, we'll weave in how the deck plays out or what we like and don't like about it as we work through these things. Um, and it's worth noting that mm. not every deck is easy as easy to get into as others. Like, Good point. Like yes. we're going to talk about this deck specifically. This is not one I find very easy to get into. No, so. degree of difficulty is high on this one for sure. Uh, and mainly because of the card I'm going to talk about next, which is not just a notable common, but an absolute linchpin for the deck, which is Cloud Blazer. Um, it's the most important card in the deck when you have it, and it leads to the most busted draws and situations and you know it, it as i was writing out the note for this i thought to myself you know the thing that i never want to happen on my end of the spectrum is for a cloud blazer to get killed <laughs> so i i put a hint here i said if you're playing against this deck and your opponent gives you an opening to kill the cloud blazer you should kill the cloud blazer because the thing is it feels terrible to use a removal spell on a cloud blazer, right? Like they just drew two cards off the damn thing. They gained two life. And now you're going to, you know, increase their card count by also killing it. It doesn't feel good, but it is often correct to do because A, it's a threat, right? It's 2-2 two, two flyer. It's probably going to get in for a decent amount of damage anyway. And B, these decks, these blue white decks are just always built to abuse it. And there's a bunch of ways they can do that. We'll talk about that in just a second. But cloud blazer is absolutely... Like, Honestly, for me, th that's the main way that I get into this deck at all is that I just I open a cloud blazer and I take it. Like, yeah, that's I, it. Th that that's the difficulty I have is that without that card, it's it's hard for me to end up uh, drafting this deck. But we'll get to that later in the how do you get into this deck discussion. Okay, so cloud blazer is important. Uh, Wisp Weaver Angel, really important too. Um, it's a you know another uncommon, of course, but it gives you two things that you really want in this deck in one card, which is fantastic. It gives you a big flying threat, right? It gives you a 4-4 with flying, which is certainly on the menu for, for a blue-white deck like this. But it also gives you a blink effect built into it, which your deck is often going to translate into onboard advantage or card advantage or something. And the, the fact that these two effects are on one card is fantastic. And it makes it really one of the key cards for the archetype. 
Another one, um, you know, that is a good example of a card that can generate you onboard advantage through these type of blink, blink and return type effects is experimental aviator, right? It's, you know, it's the three blue, blue for an O3 with flying and you get two one, one flying thopters when it enters the battlefield. But man, this is the deck for it, right? Cause I'm actually a little higher on that card than most I've, I've heard numerous pros sort of shrug at it, but I think it's pretty decent anyway, but really this is where you want it, right? This is where you, you know, you whisper your angel it and now you're spewing out a bunch of more tokens or, you know, uh, you, you, you can blink it with the other cards we're going to talk about in the commons and, and you, you're generating one, one flyers, you know, two of them per, per reactivation. And those add up really fast. One, one flyers are, you know, worth half to two thirds of a card or something. If you want to think about it like that. And two of them is definitely, you know, a card worth of value. And, uh, and so you're generating like, you know, actual onboard advantage with it rather than servos, which are good, but you know, oftentimes can be hard to capitalize on. I think secretly experimental aviator is the way, is the way I end up in this deck because, uh, it is the best blue card to pair with these white blink cards. Mm. And cause one, one of the interesting things about this deck is that it is, and it, this is actually true of most decks involving white. It it, it it ends up being more white than the other color. Yes, like, that is very true. Like we can, we're going to take a look at the key commons in a second, and they're all white except one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and the reason for that is that the white cards really play into the theme really strongly, and then the reason that the blue the blue comes in is for cards like Cloud Blazer and Experiment Aviator. So, uh, I think I think Aviator is really a, a very important card for this deck. Much more important in this deck than it would be any other deck, even though it's playable in other decks. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's, take, let's take a look at the key commons because they really do tell a lot of the story here. So uh, Acrobatic Maneuver, right? That one comes to mind. The two and a white, blink your creature, draw a card. Uh, you know, this is just a great way to generate value. Right. And, and, you know, when you think about these the generating value, it's not just cloud blazer, that's just the best, but you can also do, you know, visionary augmenter or anything with fabricate, anything that, that gives a counter, anything like that, you know, you can throw those around and, uh, and start generating value. I mean, you can even do uh, nimble innovator or whatever, you know, uh, which is a card I'm not like super high on, but Hey, you know, you could do worse than, than drawing an extra card. Aviary mechanic is, a, is a, a really important slot at common as well. Aviary mechanic lets you slowly, albeit, but it lets you replay cards like cloud blazers and such for value later, exp experimental aviators and all this stuff that I just mentioned. But it also fills, it's like two different cards in the deck because it also just lets you play something on turn two. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the first time your opponent plays a night market lookout on turn one, you're going to be really glad that you've got aviary mechanics in your deck because that's scary. It's really scary. Like you can lose the game very, very quickly if somebody's decided to go kind of with the all in aggro deck, which does exist in the format and is, and is quite viable and you need things to do early in the game. And then the mechanic, you know, really does transition nicely into the late game where it can uh, help generate value if you're trying to grind your opponent out. Um, ether trade wins is another one that you can use to get value. Basically, you know, you're trying to offset it because you have to spend a card to return one of your permanents and one of theirs, but you're trying to get that card back because since you're the one doing it, so you get some of that back by the tempo that you gain from having your opponent have to replay their creature. And sometimes they've put an enchantment or they've targeted it with a combat trick or something along those lines. Maybe they dumped a bunch of extra mana to equip it or whatever, and you feel like you're getting your value anyway. But when you get to return your own creature and then replay it for value, like, you know, any of these enter the battlefield type creatures, that feels great. Um, you can also do this, by the way, um, Aether Trade Winds, you know, you can also return Prophetic Prisms with it, which isn't a key card in the deck, but it's something that I just thought would be a good side note because I've been doing a lot of that. And the other thing, you know, you can do with Aether Trade Winds, it's kind of mean, but I have done it, I don't know, three or four times already in the format, is you can bounce your opponent's lands. And I've done it, man. I've done it. Uh, you know, I have five, six lands out and they're stuck on three. And, you know, I'm like, maybe didn't have the most aggressive start, but I'm definitely ahead on board. You can absolutely just send them back, you know, into the Stone Age by by bouncing one of their lands. And I would say that it's not common that it's correct to do that, but it does pop up. So be aware of it. Um Glint Sleeve Artisan, right? That's another really good example. Cloud Blazer is kind of the dream. Glint Sleeve Artisan is like the daydream, right? It's like, yeah, that's good. You're generating value. Uh, thing to remember is that if you are in this deck, 
you are most often going to want to make the servo. Even if you don't have a way to to make the uh, to blink it yet, if you've got enough of them in your deck, you want to be thinking down the line about, well, what if I end up aviary mechanic in this back to my hand? What if I end up playing a, an, you know, a, an acrobatic maneuver on this? If you put the plus one, plus one counter on it, um, just because you just were like, oh, whatever, I'll just put a counter on it, then you might be missing out on a free servo out of the deal. So keep that in mind. And then, of course, Propeller Pioneer as well in the same vein as a Glint Sleeve Artisan. Just a good thing for you to blink. And then the fact that it also has flying is nice. Now, there is a slight downside to this one because I remember way back in the set review, Luis, you know, you, you very correctly pointed out that you're incentivized to put the plus one, plus one counter on the propeller pioneer because that counter gets flying as well. And so you are missing out on that a little bit if you are planning on blinking it a bunch, but whatever, it's still good in the deck. Yeah. I I think that you are going to start out by playing propeller pioneer with like a servo. Then the first time you bounce it, then play it as like a three, two, that's just going to be kind of one of the more common uh, ways that you end up uh, getting value out of Pioneer. Uh, so the the main, we kind of touched on this, the main way to get in this deck is Cloud Blazer. Uh, I found Experimental Aviator when you have like three or four white cards also would be a pretty good way mm-hmm. because there aren't that many blue pulls at common. So it's really just blue uncommons, which is why I end up not drafting this deck very often. Yeah. But but it is certainly a deck. It is. And, and again, uh, it's pretty risky to try to draft this deck without the necessary power uncommons or rares, you know, the, the cloud blazers and the wisp weaver angels. So it, like you, like Luis said, you will not often find yourself in the deck because you do kind of need to set it up early. But when you do, I, I have to say it's been, it's been probably my favorite deck. It's not the one I've drafted the most, but it's the one that I really, really enjoy playing. Um, it took me a lot of drafts to finally open a stupid cloud blazer and uh, once I finally did, it, it was the truth. I mean, that card is just completely busted. Um, but I do think the deck's very powerful. And uh, if you do open a Clown Blazer, you know, don't be afraid to build around a little bit. And and this is another good one, by the way, to use that litmus test on where you're like, well, what if I don't have a Cloud Blazer? <laughs> you know, are you blinking a bunch of just stupid, you know, things that don't do anything? Well, you might want to reconsider that. Make sure you have a bunch of good targets to, uh, to a bounce. Okay, what about the next one? Uh, white, black artifacts and... It's funny because this deck's kind of two different decks, but they, they overlap so much. It definitely makes the most sense to talk about them as one. Mm. Uh, the, the the grindy version is actually very similar to the white-blue deck where you are playing the good white ways to return and blink your creatures along with uh, a couple black cards that care about artifacts, black removal spells, and just trying to generate incremental card advantage. Yeah. This is the deck that uh, Restoration Gearsmith very, is very clearly like the, the flag bearer for this deck. Yeah. Uh, the more aggressive version leans heavier on the black aggressive creatures that care about artifacts, like the Emerald Bruiser and Doomed Operatives of the world, along with like Renegade Freighter. And you, one of the strengths of this color combination, I think, is that you don't have to decide which version of the deck you're drafting until pretty late, and sometimes you don't, you never even have to hard commit because so many of the cards are just good in both decks. Like they Aviary just overlap mechanic, a lot. Yeah, Aviary Mechanic and, and Doomed Operative are just cards that are good in both versions. And right. may, maybe mechanics a little better when you, your your focus is on returning metal spinners, puzzle knots, and whatnot. But it's still going to be a fine card in the aggressive version. So I, I really like white black. I've found white black to be quite good just because it has a good range, which means it's got a lot of different openings to end up one place or the other. It's much less reliant on individual cards than something like white blue. Uh, and it's just very deep. There's just a lot of cards in both colors that are good for the deck. Uh, yeah. The, the notable in commons, Restoration Gearsmith, certainly the headliner. This is how you end up white-black a lot of the time just because it is exactly what the deck wants and plays so well with so many of the cards. Yep. You, you've got a, a, and a bunch of black artifact build-arounds like Emerald Bruiser, uh, Oval Chase Daredevil, and Underhanded Designs. So all these cards reward you heavily for having artifacts. They're all actually good both aggressively or defensively. Like Underhanded Designs uh, you know, drains them for one if you pay one when you play an artifact. That that card is, is better in a control deck because it does sure. you know, pay you off the longer it sticks around. But it also can do the last three or four points of damage and kill a creature in an aggro deck. Uh, Oval Chase Daredevil, the 4-2 that comes back from your graveyard when you play an artifact. Card is great. It's good on offense or on defense. This is a, one of the few cards like this that can actually block. So if you play – like I, I've played this card against like aggressive red-white decks and they if they don't have like a revoke privileges, like they're just in such trouble. Like – 
they're going to attack their thriving grubs into this, and then you, um, next turn I'm going to play a puzzle knot or a you know r- random you know percata pillar bug, and all of a sudden just draw four two out of my graveyard. Like they're not winning that game very easily. Right. So those are like some of the notable uncommons, and then uh, there's also. Uh, just a general desire for artifacts because this is an artifact based deck so cards like snare thopter and other just random good artifacts are a little better here though you don't have to adjust your pick order all that much no yeah it's just more like a little asterisk on those that just like this is this is where they're perfect you know like you're yeah. you're always going to play your snare thopters but this is where they're just amazing right yeah. like wow you know but like you said you're probably taking snare thopter over most things anyway just because it's a really good card so the, some of the key commons uh, are like uh, Doomed Operative, I think, is just one of the best commons for the deck. Just two mana, three, two Death Touch is just so good. Uh, one thing to note, by the way, when we're going through key commons, we didn't mention Revoke Privileges in either of these decks because that card is just good. Like that, that is a good card for any white deck. Yeah, we, we wanted def- to focus on the ones that are specific to these right. decks. These are, right, these are yeah. deck-specific cards that change value in this deck. So... We're not going to mention like Weldon Sparks in the red based decks because that's just the best red common no matter what you're doing. So you, you should just take Welding Sparks and be happy with it. We're, we're going to talk about cards like, you know, Pricotta Pillar Bug here because that changes value in this deck uh, as opposed to uh, a different like black based deck. Uh, so Deck Doomed Operative, Pricotta Pillar Bug, like Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot. Malta Squad. These are all ways to just get artifacts into play that have other good effects on the game, like mm-hmm. you know the three one menace out of Malta Squad, and then Pillar Bug. That card just overperformed. We kind of talked about that last week uh, yeah. in the set re- review. And just doing two, operative. Oh, yeah, two, two three two three life link uh, along with like subtle strike is great. Uh, Aviary mechanic and a lot of white blink cards are like acrobatic maneuver are quite good in the controlling version and then like decent in the aggro version, though you're not super excited. Yeah. I and, never end up playing those in that ver- like acrobatic maneuver. I yeah. Never end acrobatic up maneuver in specifically. You yeah. don't play in the aggro deck. Right. Uh, the biggest card that, that doesn't, there's great in one version and not in the other is renegade freighter, which is mm. fantastic in the, in the aggressive version of the deck. Cause it's an artifact and a, just a huge beater. Yeah. But you don't really want it in the controlling version of the deck. Right. Okay. So the, the easiest way to get into this deck besides uh, Restoration Gearsmith is just if black and white are open, it, it was just funny yeah. because, I mean, that, that doesn't sound like, oh, you're, you have to, you know, you know, what's the secret path to drafting black white? It's like, well, it's it's if you see a lot of black and white cards because it, it's actually a strength. The black and the white cards just all work together so well. Yeah, they really and, do. And But you do have to know, right? Like you do have to respect the fact that you are building, like you have to know the Dune operatives are one of your better cards. Right, and that you're planning on having them be three two, death touch for two mana like most of the time. Where you know when we originally started the format, it would have been like, well, how often is this actually a thing, and does it really? It's like no, no. You, if you build it right, you can have those things just be on all the time. You can have your embral bruisers be three three one menaces for two mana, which is a really good deal too. So, yeah, uh, I I think the key is that you you understand that you are going to be maximizing on these. Uh, artifact synergies and that you need to draft towards that. But beyond that, yeah, I mean, they're, the deck just comes together naturally. Yeah, and, and again, how, how this ends up is you'll see like a Doomed Operative or you'll see uh, just like a card, that, like a Malthus Squad or, or something along those lines, an Emerald Bruiser that kind of fits in with your white cards and you end up just kind of going into this deck or you'll, mm-hmm. or you'll pick up on underhanded designs fourth or fifth. That's not that hard to do. And then you, you kind of lean into taking more puzzle knots and something along those lines. So I, I really like black white. Uh, this is one of the decks I draft the most frequently just cause it's just a good combination of power and consistency. Be- it's just more consistent because it doesn't lean on individual cards as much and it can be aggro or control, which means the range of cards you can take and, you know, be happy with is just so much wider. Yeah. You know, and, like, it's funny, I, I don't want to keep harping on this, but like, if you do that same test we talked about earlier on this deck, it's almost unaffected, right? Its power level oh, goes yeah. down a little bit, but it doesn't care about any one specific thing. You know, if you take away the Restoration Gearsmith, you're obviously bummed about that, but the deck fully operates without it. It's just not yeah. as good. Okay. Oh, this next one, Luis. Yeah, this next one's a interesting one. It, it's th- this... This deck actually is a lot of different decks, but we're going to kind of try to talk through the skeleton. This is this one might uh, this one goes a little deep. So this is I have it listed as green, blue energy slash five color green. Yeah. But but really what this what this really means is like a there's a variety of green based archetypes here that are largely dependent on energy, but don't have to be 
sometimes two colors, but sometimes more. And yep. there, 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 there's a kind of a method to this madness. So we'll, we'll try to get through it. Uh, so for the more energy based versions, you have these notable uncommons like Whirler Virtuoso. Oh, God. Note, note this is a red blue card. Uh, but it's best in a green deck. <laughs> it is. It really is. It yeah. honestly, I think I've played it in green more than any other color combo. I've had it in red blue itself, like maybe once, and it's good. But like, just uh, impossible to draft red blue. <laughs> it, yeah, you just can't draft that. Uh, it's so crazy, and this card's so good. Like, I take it so highly now in these green decks. Uh, Era of innovation. If you're leaning on energy, mm-hmm. whenever you play an uh, artifact or artificer, you can pay one to get two energy, and then you sack six, sack it, and, and pay six energy to draw three cards. Uh, Imperial Voyager, the two three uh, flying trample. Uh, the what? That flying trample two three. Uh, the the that, f- flying trampler. Okay. Yeah, flying trample. Right. Um, two separate words. Uh, when it hits them, you get energy equal to the amount of damage you deal. Uh, yep. Long tusk cub, the two two. When you hit them, oh, them you get two energy. Pay two energy, put up plus plus one counter on it. Like th- these are all these like really good energy build arounds that reward you for going down the energy path. And then you have fabrication and decoction module, uh, fabrication being l- more powerful, but decoction module also working quite well with things like world of virtuoso. So if you get one of these cards early and a lot of these cards are early picks, in fact, uh, mm-hmm. all of them, almost all of them are just like, I, I, I'm not like super stoked about first picking era of innovation or decoction module. The other four cards here, the virtuoso Voyager cub and fabrication module. I, w- I am happy first picking. Mm-hmm. Um, these are all cards that you can take early and draft an energy deck around and be really happy about. Uh, so these are one of the ways that are some of the ways that you kind of start going down this path. And then the, the key commons are prophetic prism. I think this card is actually better than the other commons in either colors. Uh, it is, it really deck. is. It is too good in this deck, man. It is so good. Because, you know, the, the thing uh, that, that's easy to overlook, right, is that it, it makes the color that you need when you need to make it and it can change that. Right, yeah. where like you're attuned with ethers, which is the next card on the list here, and also very important, doesn't right? It goes and gets your mountain, so you can play your whirler virtuoso. But then, you know, when you draw, you know, your whatever your unlicensed disintegration or whatever, you're like, oop, out of luck. You know, where the prophetic prism is is much more flexible, and that that really goes a long way when you're pushing the the limits of your mana base a little bit. It also just randomly makes gear seeker sermon cheaper yeah. combined with ether trade wins, just all these like little combos that, that work out. Yeah. Uh, attuned with ether, as you said, provides energy and mana fixing. Uh, ether theorist is a, another card, which makes the deck a lot more consistent because it provides you a bunch of energy to power your energy cards. And then it helps you scry to find them. Uh, I've been happy with that card, by the way. Yeah. I think ether theorist is quite good in this deck. It's thumbs up. Yeah. It, it blocks too. too. Yeah, definitely. And three energy is a lot. And I, yeah, I, I think theorist really, really holds its own in this deck. Uh, thriving rhino is actually a card I go back and forth on. Uh, it's good in some versions and bad in others. Basically the more defensive you are, the less good it is, but there are versions of this deck that are actually kind of aggressive that just play a bunch of thriving rhinos and like Riparian tiger and even thriving turtle and just, you know, are attacking your opponent. Yeah, I I haven't found one where I felt like it was bad. Like, because a turn three Thriving Rhino can almost always attack into whatever your opponent's doing. And even if you're a more defensively positioned deck, you the the, the bottleneck on these decks is not energy. You, you usually have a surplus of energy with these decks. And I found a Thriving Rhino to be a really good place to throw that energy. Now, yeah, it does happen sometimes that it's turn eight and you draw it and you're not thrilled, right? Because you're, you're playing a two, three for three that, that doesn't really get to do much in attack. So it does have a downside. It's not perfect. But even then, I'm not, you know, that's not a dead card, right? That's still at least something that does something. It gives you some extra energy, um, you know, that you may need at that point. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty across the board on rhino i mean i've definitely recognized when it's really good and when it's not as good but i've never found it to be bad yeah the the the, the floor on that is pretty high uh, mm-hmm. yeah wild wander is another way it's w- the worst of the fixing options at, you know after prism and a tune but still playable card three two that searches yeah. out of land yep another uh key comment is welding sparks and then uh reverse <laughs> yeah. comments <laughs> yes <laughs> sparks being much better but they're both splashable cards that uh i do like having in the deck yeah. So the ways you get into deck are also varied. Uh, the easiest one is to open a good energy payoff, like Virtuoso, one of the modules, uh, uh, you know, a sweet energy rare. Mm-hmm. And then and then you can end up taking these green cards because green's so good at generating energy and defending yourself. And then uh, it just has high quality cards in general. And then you end up 
you know, pairing it with blue, if you have theorists and you know, ether meltdown, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, the other is that green is just open. And yeah, you know, this, this kind of describes a lot of the green decks because green splashes so easily that unless you're one of the aggressive green decks, which we're not covering this week, but uh, do exist, you know, like, like a red green deck uh, yeah. or, or, or even sometimes green black can be aggressive. Like uh, these are the kind of decks that don't want to splash, but like the, kind of looser, more controlling, you know, green, blue X decks are the ones that often will splash. So if green is open, you're just naturally going to be like, well, I have a wild wander and a tune with ether. I probably should splash a card. Cause I, you know, I got past the sky wheeler shot. Yeah. Uh, the other is that you start with a good splashable card. So you end up like, let's say you took an early welding sparks and then you took some green cards and then you end up, you know, picking up some random fixers and you, you realize that you don't need to, to draft red. You can draft blue instead, or you can draft black, and then you end up, you know, green splashing a color or two. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me where I first picked Welding Sparks or Sky Whaler Shot and just red and or white, respectively, just were completely not open. You know, but these are cards that I do want in my deck. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, and and I end up, you know, oh, Pima Outrider. Oh, there's a Wild Wanderer. Oh, okay, a Seed Sculptor. And all of a sudden I'm like green with this other color that's just not there. And I end up being like, okay, an Ether Theorist. All right, I'll take that. And then, you know, like all of a sudden we're right into the thick of this deck where we've got two pieces of mana fixing, a premium piece of removal that's off color. And it's like, well, this is going in the deck. Like it's a, it's a nearly free splash and it's, you know, my best removal. So that happens all the time. Uh, and then the other is uh, other way to end up in uh, this kind of like green aggressive energy deck is if you just get cards like the Kudra Seed Sculptor, Thriving Rhinos, mm-hmm. Pima Outriders, uh, even Thriving Turtle can actually be a real threat in this de- these decks. It can, yep. Uh, Ether Theorist is still good in this kind of deck, and uh, Imperial Voyager is actually a big draw for this and Long Tusk Cub because those are the ones that really reward you for being aggressive and caring about energy. Yeah, the Cub's insane. Uh, and then you know Gear Seeker Serpent actually fits here too. So yeah, I found I found that it's very deck dependent like yes. i can like in fact i i actually put a picture on twitter of of uh, a pure energy deck this is a little different than this version but it was just like an all-in energy like rug energy deck and i didn't run a gear Se- seeker serpent in it because i was so light on artifacts that i was like eh, i don't really need it and my deck was you know completely insane without it but i have often ran it because the truth is that gear seeker serpent is fine at six mana yeah you know, and that that happens all the time. You know, you just play like your one whatever, you know, that we talked about prophetic prism. You know, it's like, OK, I've got my prism or you end up with like a servo from a Pima Outrider or something like that. And then you're paying six for your serpent. And it's like this is a good top end card. And especially when you're, you know, hitting your your land drops consistently with the tune with ethers and, and prism helps you do that, too. Or even when you're ramping with like a wild wanderer. You know, it's it's not that hard to go Wild Wanderer, get a land, play a land, and then play a Gear Seeker Serpent the next turn. Like that's pretty powerful. Yeah, I think that uh, you 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 should not need to think Gear Seeker needs to cost four to be happy with the card. Yeah, I agree. It's just a good card, even even if it does cost six or even it's like you wouldn't play it if it only cost seven very often, but it's not that far off. So. Yeah, just unblockable five damage at the end of the game is really really good in this format. Yeah. So once you remove the energy component, you can there's still a deck here. It's a yes. slightly different deck because so many of the cards naturally deal with energy. So if you're heavy green, it's kind of hard to end up, you know, imagining, oh, you have zero rhinos or zero repairing tigers, or you're just playing a tiger kind of by itself because it's just like a reasonable creature. Mm-hmm. But th- it is possible to not have any heavy energy build arounds, in which case you're not, you know, you're not like a decoction module deck. Like you're not taking that card, for example. Mm-hmm. And th- then you just end up with like a five color green high quality deck with just good removal spells and good green cards. Usually you're like two base colors. Blue is the one that I find the most common second, but it doesn't have to be. And, you know, multiple off color cards that, or, or green blacks actually also kind of common because you want, want like tidy conclusion is just a good card for decks like this. Right. So I think that the, the key, uh, we actually kind of covered it with the level up on splashing that, that we did. Uh, once you once you get used to how you can manage Prism, Attune with Ether, Wild Wander, and Splash cards, that's a, a lot of the ways to draft the like non-aggressive green decks in this format. I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Do you like this deck? <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you're talking about all the like nuts and bolts, but I don't get a vibe if you think this deck is good or if you enjoy drafting it. Like, uh, I definitely I'm enjoy loving it. I definitely enjoy drafting it. I I think that. I think that it's good, but this deck does definitely run into the problem of if you don't draw your World of Virtuous, so your deck can end up with 16 energy and do nothing with it. Oh, that's the worst feeling. <laughs> so 
uh, you do need to make sure that you're you're prioritizing uh, backup energy sinks and having just like a good curve and good quality of cards uh, uh, regardless. Uh, you, basically, if you don't have a good curve, you do need cards like Arborback Stomper to catch you up. And if you and if you do end up uh, without good cards to splash, sometimes you are like, well, I third pick Prophetic Prism and fourth pick a tune, but I'm just playing two colors. And I th- that wasn't actually good value. So yeah. it, a lot has to... Not a lot has to go right because there's a lot of interchangeable parts, but you do need to pick up these the different components for this deck, or you or you will end up with uh, kind of inconsistent uh, mess up cards. That actually are, happened to me, by the way. You, you just had nothing to splash. No, the description that when you were talking about yeah. Ruler Virtuoso, I had I had either sixteen or seventeen energy and nothing to spend it on, and my opponent was kind of smashing me, and I did I top decked Ruler Virtuoso and I put it on the st- oh and I also had a decoction module on the board, yeah, yeah. and my opponent just goes oh god, <laughs> it's like great I think I made seven <laughs> thopters like that turn, and then uh, I think I lost anyway, but <laughs> I but I've been really enjoying this deck and. It's starting to become kind of my default as well. Like if I don't see anything I really like and, and you know, there's definitely I'm, – I'm really starting to get picky with my drafts about like I want to do some cool stuff. I want to do some powerful stuff. I want to experiment. Well, you know, we're in the most dangerous part of the format for oh, us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is – and we've talked about this before where you – have drafted, uh, you know, you've drafted all the normal decks, and now you're dra- dra- only draft the sweet ones, which does not always bode well for your win percentage. No, it doesn't. Although I have to say, I've been getting there. Oh, sweet, <laughs> sweet decks do work in this, in this, uh, yeah, in this format. I, I have drafted a lot of sweet decks that have performed well. I have too, and and they've happened lately. I feel like I'm really, really getting into a groove with the format as far as these subtle things. But I know. I'm giving up some win percentage because I do fall for that same trap I referenced earlier where like there's cards that I'm like, yeah, I know what that does. Like, it, you know, yeah, revoke privileges is a good card. I'll probably take it. And then like at the last second, I'll be like, I'll just take a tune. <laughs> you know, let's just like I literally had a draft well, where I, I guess I, you're going pretty deep. Then I first picked a tune with ether, uh, not not over revoke, but over, you know, mediocre stuff. Um, though it was not the best card in the pack, I just didn't want to play the other cards. And, and I, and then I second picked uh prism and I thought, okay, I'm just going to take all this, like whatever colors I want, I'm just going to take it. Whatever I open for the rest of the draft, I'm just going to take it. And, uh, just to sort of slap me in the face, I got a seventh pick, a tune in that first pack. Yeah. It's like, hmm, <laughs> maybe I'm doing something. You're the reason here. no one else has a tunes. They have all their Beaumont Bazaar yeah. barges and you have all the attunes. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, you know, you're doing something wrong when you first pick a card that gets passed to you seventh. But uh, anyway, that that's a personal problem. Um, yeah, but I love that deck. Uh, I think it's really sweet because it, it – y- because it satisfies a thing for me, which is that w- one of my grades for a great draft format is when I first pick my when I pick my first card, do I know exactly what my deck is going to look like? And I love formats where I don't. Right, uh, you know, looking at Modern Masters and Innistrad and stuff like that, you could take a card first pick, and it does not dictate everything. Where if we go to car- sets that I haven't enjoyed for the long term as much, like Battle for Zendikar, after my first pick, I know exactly what my deck's going to look like. It's just a question of how good of a version of it is it, and uh, and I think I find myself, like you said, getting into the danger zone here late in the format, where I'm just like, I try not to first pick cards that I know. Well, this is just going to be some some beat down thing. Um, at least when I'm drafting a magical line, I gotta say it's been working. I've been kind of smashing lately. Okay, uh, next one is white red vehicles. This is a perfect definition of a deck that I just have no interest in playing anymore. In the yeah, I was gonna say it's your favorite deck. Uh, <laughs> so the, the name is vehicles. It doesn't actually have to have vehicles, but it's kind of like green with energy, where it just ends up having vehicles a good amount of the time because that's how you uh, end up there. Um, but it's an aggressive beatdown deck, and it uh, sometimes has vehicle synergy, sometimes not. Uh, notable uncommons. The list isn't very long, and uh, that's actually good for the deck. Uh, so it has like veteran motorist, uh, you know, Malthus doorbuster, gearshift ace, and you know these are good cards that are good in this deck specifically. But one of the reasons that there's not that many notable uncommons is that yeah, the premium uncommons like you know harness lightning, fairgrounds ward, and skywheel shot are all great in the deck. That that's fine. This deck doesn't actually need uncommons. It's actually a common based deck, which is a, is a real strength in terms of consistency. So. If you look at the commons, again, besides Welding Sparks and Revoke Privileges, it has like Renegade Freighter is by far the best common for what this deck is trying to do. Right. Uh, built to Smash and Built to Last are both quite important. Com- cheap yep. combat tricks that are effective are great. Uh, Eddie Trail Hawk. Th- this like whole mess of kind of like 
you know, red aggro cards like Spontaneous Artist, Spiderside Infiltrator, Thriving Grubs, Wayward Giant. Like, th these are all cards that a lot of decks are, are not necessarily going to want, but are, it fit very well in this deck. And then, the the you know, PV these, zone? Yeah, exactly. Apollo uh, just snapped off a bunch of Spiderside Infiltrators and 3 0 that draft. Yep. At the Pro Tour. Uh, yeah, he loves these cards. Glintsleeve Artisan, you know, just a, 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 a very solid card here. And, you know, it's pretty easy to get into this deck. Uh, you, first of all, Renegade Freighter is, is the I think, the easiest way. You know, mm -hmm. you just take the train, train right to white to right, white, right to right, right, right. Why can't he? I can't even, <laughs> if I this this is great. What's going on? Right Are you okay? to white red. There we go. That is hard to that, say, dude. <laughs> that was actually a tongue twister of some kind. Yeah. Um, but... You know, Renegade Freighter is is definitely at its best in the white red deck, and uh, you you also just end up here if if you end up just seeing a, a good like combination of aggressive cards. Like th th you're gonna first pick something like besides Freighter, something like Welding Sparks, you know, mm -hmm, or something like mm -hmm. Revoke. If you if you're just taking like a decent common, you know, maybe you take a Glint Sleeve Artist, an Aviary Mechanic. These are all just normal cards, and then and then you see uh, a Spireside Infiltrator, and there's nothing that really calls out to you, and then you see a Built to Smash, and then an Eddie Trailhawk, and it's like, oh, I just have a bunch of aggressive white red cards, and now I'm drafting this like kind of low curve beatdown deck that finishes, you know, with like. A Wayward Giant or a Bastion Mastodon, which are our playable cards in this deck. So, this is again the opposite of the you know five color green deck, but this this kind of, this deck does keep that deck in check. Like if you're if you're playing these like nonsense, if your turn two is Prophetic Prism and you're casting a Tunes and you're going to play a Wild Wanderer so you can play your Splash card, and your opponent just goes like Thriving Grubs into Renegade Freighter into no. literally any card on turn four, you, you just like, oh right, that that's what can happen. Right. Like it's it's not all fun and games. You're not all playing against the blue white blink deck that doesn't get anything going for a cute couple turns. So, yeah. uh, red white certainly very good. Uh, also has like the hallmarks of a successful deck in that it just needs a bunch of different commons, and those commons are not ones a lot of other decks are gonna want. Like you, you can definitely draft red and white decks that don't want built to smash or are built to last, and this this red white deck will pick those up very happily. You yeah. know, you're gonna get your eighth pick, tenth pick, spire side infiltrators, and you'll you'll be happy with that. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, and I think it bears mentioning again here. Uh, you know, we we purposely didn't put a lot of the common removal spells and, and uncommon removal spells here on these lists because those are cards that you're going to take highly in play in any deck that plays it in the colors, right? We don't need to put, well, Welding Sparks is a key part of the, you know, it, it is one of the best cards in the deck. It's, we, we haven't forgotten those. It's just, you should assume that, you know, premium removal spells are going to be premium removal spells regardless. Um, but the interesting thing that I have found with this and the reason why I want to bring it up here is that they are at an absolute premium because when the stupid green, you know, energy deck is stealing your sky whaler shots and your welding sparks and stuff like that, you have to take them because they are never going to take your combat tricks from you. They will never take, you know, your, like you said, your, your spire side infiltrators and your wayward giants. They don't care about those cards but they really want the removal spells that you do too. And those are going to be hotly contested and you basically have to take them anytime you see them because you just won't get them late. The problem is, you know, in a normal scenario, like take a card like uh hunt the week, right? Like a decent removal spell in green, you know, the green decks are fighting over that card, right? It's a fine card. It, it makes the, the cut in most of these decks. So anybody else who's drafting green may be interested in it and you have to consider them. But if you're red, white, and you're looking at a card like Welding Sparks, it's not just the red decks that want them. It's right. also the green deck. So there's going to be multiple people at the table that are willing to take them. Therefore, you will never see them late and you have to take them early. So even though you know, we, we outlined a lot of the key comments and uncommons here and some of the ways that you can get into the thing. Don't forget that the removal is going to be snatched up by not just you and people playing your colors, but other people as well. So you have to take it super early. Yeah, and the good thing is you can spend your early picks on that and spend your late picks on filling out the deck and you'll be in pretty good shape, which is, it's kind of something that happens. Like if you look at all the decks we're talking about, like the white decks overlap a lot. Aviary Mechanic is a card I think we've mentioned in all the decks, but a lot of the cards in this format go to one deck or the other, which I think is interesting. It is nice when there's some overlap, but not too much because it's less good when it's like one of the reasons I didn't like Modern Masters, for example, the first one, is that everyone mm -hmm. just settled on their two-color combination and no one – like you were drafting White Blue Affinity. No one else cared about the Affinity cards. You just took all right. those, whereas the White Green token deck 
would just take all the token cards and you could draft white next to white next to white and all three of you were looking at different di- looking for different cards mm-hmm. that that's less interesting you just pick a lane and settle on it here at least there's enough overlap that everyone wants welding sparks a lot of the white decks want the same white cards etc et but all, there's a lot of divergence too where yeah, no one else wants spontaneous artist and built to smash, you know, inspire side infiltrator if they're drafting a like a you know a controlling red deck. Which, granted, there aren't that many of. So, but going back to something like Eddie Trailhawk, like a lot, like the white blue deck is just not going to want Eddie Trailhawk most of the time. You know, the the white black deck, if it's aggressive, wants it, but if it's defensive, certainly doesn't. So, right. you, you you end up being able to fill out your late picks with cards that you want and other people don't, which is what you're trying to do. Right. And now one other thing that you touched on just at the beginning of the uh, the white red vehicles was how you don't it doesn't have to be a vehicles based deck. Like is is a fair way to describe that to say that um, there are some synergies, but that it's basically power level considerations, meaning that like my deck is better because I have a renegade freighter in it, but it's not because of like some inherent synergies. It's just because that card's good. Yeah, like Renegade Fitter is a great card in this deck. Uh, Veteran Motors is a great card in this deck. And Gearshift Ace is a great card in this deck. They work better when you draw one of the pilots with the vehicle. All the cards work fine on their own. 2 1 First Strike is great. Three, 2 mana 3 1 Scry 2 is great. You know, Renegade Fitter is great. So don't be tunnel visioned on like, oh, I need to get X vehicles or I need to get X pilots or anything like that. It's mostly just take the card that's individually best and then some of them have little like bonus synergies. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, we've got one more to go over here. Um, and this is one that I've drafted a heck of a lot of it's uh, white, black or white, green go wide. So this is yet another, and you mentioned this earlier, Luis, and it is very true. Uh, white base deck. Uh, this has a lot of white cards that are important to it. It uses token generator generators, like mainly fabricate, but there's a few others in there as well to generate a ton of small creatures, which can win the game with inspired charge generally speaking that's kind of your big payoff the deck usually plays out aggressively to start with a good creature or removal curve that you'll see sort of in any of the color combinations that we have here but after that it either overwhelms the opponent with expendable creatures to attack with meaning that you've got seven one ones or small creatures and they've got three blockers and they're low on life and you just say sure attack with everything and kill them or again it it wins with an inspired charge and you kill your opponent with that so some of the notable uncommons for this deck, Visionary Augmenter, right? That's the two one that has Fabricate 2 for 4 mana. So that's giving you three creatures for one card. Weapon Craft Enthusiast is the smaller version of that. It's the two and a black for an O one one with Fabricate 2. Again, three creatures for one card. Um, basically, anything with Fabricate 2 is going to go in this deck. Um, Engineered Might is a good finisher if you happen to be the white-green version because you can pump up your whole team and kill them. Another uncommon... That I, I wouldn't call it a key uncommon is servo exhibition. Uh, you know, one in a white gives you two one ones. But I've been generally underwhelmed by servo exhibition. But this is the place for it. You, you, yeah. if, if 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 you do want to play that card, this this is the type of deck you want it in. It's been pretty bad in almost every deck, but it's good in yeah. this deck. Yeah, this is the one for it. Um, key and co- key commons inspired charge it is really the 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 crux of the deck. This is the most important card and the reason for this is simple a it's your it's your late game plan it it is your ability to leverage all of the extra one ones and and servos and what whatnot that you've that you've garnered over the course of the game and b you're the only deck that wants it and that's really important um you can pick these up relatively late you do not have to say oh Second pick, do I take a Glint Sleeve Artisan or Inspire Charge? Because I need an Inspire Charge. You just take the Artisan. You're going to get the Inspire Charge back a lot of the time. And if you don't, you probably have multiple picks. It's a common, so you see it all the time. And uh, again, it's just not hotly contested. If you're the only person playing the strategy, you're the only one that wants them. So basically, any of the ones that get opened at the table, you're going to have a shot at. That said, you do want them. I, I've played three in a deck and been like, yeah, no problem. Um, I haven't played four yet, although I have had a chance to play four in this deck and declined it. I think that was correct, but uh, I didn't try, so I don't know. I, you know, there is definitely it's, an issue with getting too like many Three seems like the most of them. optimal number. Yeah, I think it is, and because there are definitely times when you can uh, put together game plans where you attack with even just two evasive creatures, two small flyers, and you go inspire charge next turn, inspire charge, and you can get in enough damage. Um, usual suspects, you'll see a lot of these as well. Aviary mechanic. 
that lets you pick up your augmenters and enthusiasts and propeller pioneers and whatever and uh, replay them to generate more and more tokens. Glint Sleeve Artisan is, is a great card in this <clears throat> deck. It's a great card in general, but, you know, again, three mana, two creatures. One of them is even a 2-2. Two -two. That's really nice. Um, Pima Outrider, same thing. Propeller Pioneer, Malfus Squad. You can see these are all just basically the Fabricate creatures, right? And right. That's the key, is that you are really leveraging Fabricate here with some extra synergies in there, too, that we've touched on in other decks, the Blink deck and stuff. I mean, sure, you can acrobatic maneuver your whatever and, and you know, try to generate more tokens. But the key is that you're creating multiple creatures with each one of your cards that you can then leverage with uh, the Inspired Charge. This deck is, is interesting because this is the one that the most, I think, vividly uses the underplayed cards like inspired charge and engineered might yeah so th th this is yeah. the one where your your your, uh, your valuation changes the most it, it is a it is a good deck i think uh I, I don't end up drafting it as much as i did when the format first started i don't really know why that is specifically it might be because people are valuing fabricate cards more so it's just hard to get the critical mass of fabricate mm -hmm. creatures mm -hmm. um but it is one of the ways to best use the fabricate two creatures like the, yes. those when I see those cards, I'm starting to think Inspired Charge. And when you pick up, you know, a fifth pick Weapon Craft Enthusiast, which certainly does happen, then then you can start thinking, okay, maybe I should get some Inspired Charges in here. Yeah. Um, how do you get into this deck? Well, I kind of covered it already. But, you know, you pick up powerful token generators early, like the Visionary Augmenter, the Glint Glim Sleeve Artist, and those type of good cards in conjunction with removal spells. <clears throat> and then... You know, after you realize, well, I've got multiple token makers here, now your eye starts to look out for those inspired charges. And uh, like I said, you can pick them up later than you want um, or than, than you'd think necessarily. And, you know, two of them's good. One of them is usually not enough. I, I would want to have at least two in these type of decks. And like I said, I think three is, is where I'd stop. But I, I have played three uh, before. Um, one thing that, that also happens that, that you'll see – <laughs> is you you know you're dead when they're o one weapon craft enthusiast attacks <laughs> that's yes. that's really bad news for you <laughs> that means that they almost for sure have an inspired charge and uh you're you're in huge huge trouble um card that is very good against this deck and that really sucks to play against is make obsolete it it destroys this deck i mean it i had i was at a local shop relatively early in the format and i had a, a fantastic version of this deck with two weapon craft enthusiasts and two visionary augmenters plus two to three inspire charge and all the good stuff in between so you know i had like really an optimal one and i was just smashing i mean i was doing like you can find yourself in these scenarios where you've got eight or nine creatures and you're just waiting to draw inspire charge because you got in for some early damage with say a doomed operative or some other you know early stuff and your opponent is playing like maybe big green creatures or something like that and even if they start pressuring you you just start chumping with servo tokens because you have a lot more of those to give then when you draw your inspire charge you attack them and they go from seven life to minus 15 or whatever in one hit but my god the, my opponent i met in the finals he he had make obsolete in the main deck <laughs> <laughs> that did not work out well for me. He he ran it out there after I had played like two visionary augmenters and I picked up like nine permanents at once. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to try to rebuild now. But uh, that that is a key weakness to the deck is that if people are paying attention and they sideboard properly or if they happen to have make obsolete, you uh, – you're a little vulnerable to that card and you don't, oh, yeah. you don't want to find yourself in that position where you're trying to play around it by holding your inspired charge to protect all your creatures. I mean, you can do it. It works. They're both instant, so you can do it, but you know, n never a fun spot to be in when you're hoping your inspired charge is just sort of your game winner. But uh, yeah, I, I find that the games play out like that a lot where you have a good curve early, you know, you go two drop, three drop, revoke your guy, hit you for five, hit you for six or whatever, and you get them down to 10 or so, and then they'll start to stabilize with their bigger creatures and then you go visionary visionary augmenter make two tokens propeller pioneer make a token attack you for two the next turn and then you're like oh there's inspire charge and now they're just taking ton way way more than lethal damage or, or so. you end up where they trade real creatures for your tokens and then you get them down to like four but you have four creatures left and they have nothing because they had yes. you got more creatures than they did totally if they're trying to go small like th that's the good thing is that like you know they play a night market lookout or whatever and you're like ha <laughs> you know like that's gonna get to turn sideways once or something and then you know i'm gonna trade it off for for something small it's also good against you know menace and and that kind of things um 
<clears throat> these strategies also, as we sort of transition into the bigger picture again and wrap up the show here, I do find it really interesting to see how these different strategies play against the, the typical ways that people react to it. For example, you find yourself into some situations where you feel pretty invincible. Uh, blue, white, blink, if you're playing that first deck that we talked about and your opponent's like, revoke privileges, you know, you're just like, yeah. LOL, <laughs> right? And, you know, frankly, th th revoke and, and the like. And remember, it's not just revoke, you know, we're, we're also talking about other cards like uh, <clears throat> like malfunction and that kind of stuff too that people play regularly, you know, are not very good against the the white, black or white, green, go wide deck typically either just because you are trying to make a bunch of small creatures you're typically fabricating with one ones rather than putting the counters on. So they never really can find a, you know, if they, you know, if they revoke privileges, your two, one visionary augmenter, and you've got two, one ones to show for it. You're, you're pretty happy with that exchange, but there's all these funny, uh, little exchanges that happen. Well, there's like matchups, uh, which yeah. is interesting. Like the, the, you know, and this is typical of like magic as a whole, where like the, like the energy combo deck that has this like great unstoppable late game combo is is kind of gonna crush the like blue white blink deck if the blink deck doesn't have a good aggressive start, which often totally, it does. totally, and but, it usually doesn't, yeah. But the blink deck is gonna be a lot better at setting up defenses against like the red white aggro deck than the this energy deck where sometimes renegade freighter is like, oh wow, I really just can't beat that card. Yeah, I'm gonna so, take fifteen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? so it's just funny seeing how those those things line up. Uh, and I found there's so many different ways to go. I think this format is maybe more aggressive than we have been giving it credit for, but not a lot more. I don't know. It, what I really like about this format and what, and what I think is actually a hallmark of a good format is people don't agree on it. Mm, and mm -hmm. that's, in, and that's I think definitely the case here coming out of the pro tour over in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, looking at the discussions people are having, talking to all the people who draft a lot. Some people think this format's really aggressive and blues just bad. And, you know, you, you need to plan for aggression and you should be aggress aggressive. And some people are like, oh, yeah, no, like you, you can draft these like five color nonsense decks and going big is great. And like the fact that there's not a consensus, even among people who, who again, draft a lot and are very good, indicates to me that there's a lot of depth here. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I've been enjoying the format. I have been drafting it a lot, too, on Magic Online. So I think that does say something about it. Okay, let's call it a show here, Luis. Um, good stuff. Uh, we'll we'll talk about if we want to revisit or if we want to visit the other. You know, we, we didn't we did it by decks that, you know, stand out to us as notable archetypes rather than just saying, let's just go through each color pair and see what actually ended up being there. That's why you see, you know, the green, blue energy slash five color green kind of as this one big blob of of you know, different decks because it's more of a spectrum, you know, that you'll go on. But if there's others that come to your mind or, or dear listener, if you have some that you want us to talk about, let us know uh, via the methods that we talked about before. And we'll, we'll consider going over even more of the archetypes because there are others. Um, but these, are, these have been the ones that have really stood out to me. Uh, if you want to find us on social media for such feedback, I am Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. Uh, you can also email us lr at lrcast.com if it won't fit in 140 characters or so. I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by channelfireball.com. Make sure that you check them out for all your magic needs. And of course, if you need to sell your cards back, this is a, a key part of the ecosystem that I think a lot of people miss out on is that they'll draft with their friends a few times. They'll end up with a little pile of rares worth something, and then they just kind of sit on them. And they don't really build a constructed deck because they don't have quite enough for them. And they meant to trade them away, but they never really did. And then, you know, six months later, they look in their drawer and it, they've got these cards that kind of rotated out of standard and are, are kind of junky rares now. And that's just a, a real, you know, crime. That's a loss of value. And what you can do is you can sell those to Channel Fireball. You can package them up and send them to, to CFB. And you can either get cash if you need it, or you can get store credit. And if you get store credit, they're going to give you a 30% bonus. And that means more drafts for you. Or you can turn those cards into a deck. You can start a Canadian Highlander deck that you can work out, <clears throat> you know, build up for a while. Or you can, you know, work on a standard deck over the course of time, or maybe finish one off that you're close to. Or like I said, <clears throat> just get booster packs that you can draft more and sort of keep that chain rolling. I think that's one of the overlooked things about CFB you should make sure you check that out. Um, that's going to do it for this show though. Hopefully you, uh, you enjoyed it. We enjoyed spending some time with you and we'll see you next week. Marshall lunar resources is really heavy on tradition. The, the podcast is going on for what? Five years now. Um, seven, seven, I just, I, <clears throat> 2009. We started 2009. All right. Uh, <laughs> there we go. I knew that. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a long time listener of the show. <laughs> I've listened to a lot of episodes now. Uh, the, I actually did listen to the set review you did with Owen, by the way. 
it was long, but that was good. Uh, there, you, you built up a lot of traditions over the years, and I, you know, and one of them, uh, you know, coming up in the year will be the uh, the Limmies, the 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 Limited Resources Awards. <laughs> oh, that's right. We'll, I forgot we'll about that. I but, forgot about that tradition. <laughs> Oh, you know, we're, we're a couple of shows away or at least more than a couple of shows away. But end of the year, we'll, we'll be having that. And uh, I'd like to say that we added a new tradition to, to the show uh, yesterday. Oh, no. I already you, referenced this. You referenced this, but I need to give a full explanation because people, I don't think, got it from just that aside reference. Uh, it's called Mischief Marshall. And every uh, October 30th. People open packs and they send them to, to Marshall. They send you can send a video, you can send a picture, whatever floats your boat. Like it, it's just people opening. <laughs> Come packs. on, maybe it's maybe over. On it's over. Oh. I what endured an entire day of this nonsense. I even managed to not go off on Twitter and just go on a tirade. And now you're still just going to poke and prod at me. I just opened an increasing confusion in a dark ascension pack. Um, mm, that's but, accurate. <laughs> One of the one of the the really good things about this this holiday is that it's it really brought the LR community together, and it was not just listeners; it was also people who just like Mark. Oh, <laughs> I think Luis's Skype died. Oh, I didn't even do anything. All right, all right. Your Skype died. <laughs> Oh, I know what happened. I accidentally hit mute when I was opening the <laughs> Oh, the magic gods agree with me. Oh, this is no good. All right. Well, for a while, <laughs> Peace Master, these packs will not be going to the patrons because that – Oh, come that on, that, man. But that, that, but that goes against the spirit of Mr. Marshall, which is to use the packs for something useful. So, that's that's why I was trying to like just get something back out of it. At least you know increase the joy of the world a little. At oh, my the joy expense. of the world was was increased yeah, by a significant right. margin. You're probably so right. you know, I think the year just got a little bit better. Every October 30th, that's Mischief Marshall, and uh, you know ne next time it rolls around, now you're prepared. For it.